Good afternoon. Today, Jan, uh, June 13th, 2015. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Thanks for stopping in and watching us here on North Star Oasis. Uh, I do want to pass on a little bit of sad news. Uh, and uh, Dallas, if you can put my computer up on the screen uh, real quick. I just want to point out the fact that Jack King, who was the voice of NASA during the uh, Mercury, Apollo, and... Um, and Gemini missions has passed away at the age of 84. He died on Thursday. He is the one that you would hear saying the T minus X number of minutes and seconds countdown. And so if you have any recollection at all of the Apollo launches, Jack King is a voice that you would have heard loud and clear. So again, we just wanna take a moment to just, you know, give a little bit of, um, you know, I hate to say moment of silence, but let's just give a little bit of a tribute to the late Jack King, who passed away on Thursday. If you've been a longtime uh, viewer of the show, you'll know that every week, for the last number of weeks, we've been highlighting the presidential candidate of the week, or the flavor of the week. And we started this off with Hillary Clinton, we got her uh, moment of do, and then we went on to Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, uh, ben, Dr. Ben Carson, Carly Fiorina, and then last week we had Bernie Sanders. And so for today, we're going to go right back to Hope, Arkansas. In uh, the 19, early 1990s, President Bill Clinton was from that little town called Hope. He made a big speech about that. And now we have Mike Huckabee has rejoined the presidential contest. Uh, Huckabee ran uh, unsuccessfully in 2008. And so now uh, here we have Mike Huckabee, and who also had run a TV show on Fox News. He uh, also from Hope, Arkansas, is now running for president. And so we are going to take a look at his announcement address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Folks, it is a long way from a little brick rent house on 2nd Street in Hope, Arkansas, to the White House. But here in this small town called Hope, I was raised to believe that where a person started didn't mean that's where he had to stop. I always believed that a kid could go from hope to higher ground. And like a lot of Americans, I grew up in a small town that was far removed from the power, the money, and the influence that runs this country. But power and money and political influence have left a lot of Americans lagging behind. They work hard, they lift heavy things, and they sweat through their clothes grinding out a living. But they can't seem to get ahead, or in some cases, even stay even. My own parents were like that. And it was also here that I first ran for elected office when I ran for student council at Hope Junior High School. So it seems perfectly fitting that it would be here that I announce that I am a candidate for President of the United States of America. You know, it was eight years ago that a young, untested, inexperienced, and virtually unknown freshman senator made great speeches about hope and change. But eight years later, our debts more than doubled. America's leadership in the world is completely evaporated, and the country is more polarized than ever in my lifetime. Ninety-three million Americans don't have jobs, and many of them who do have seen their full-time job with benefits they once had become two part-time jobs with no benefits at all. We were promised hope, but it was just talk. And now we need the kind of change that really could get America from hope to higher ground.
Veterans who kept their promises to America and who have kept us free now wait for months for our country to keep its promise to veterans for basic health care and assistance to cope with the scars of the very wars that we sent them to fight. Our veterans should be getting the first fruits of our treasury, not the leftovers. Washington is more dysfunctional than ever, and it's become so beholden to the donor class who fills the campaign coffers that it ignores the fact that one in four American families are paying more than half of all of their income just for housing. Home ownership at the lowest level in decades. And a lot of young people with heavy student debt aren't likely to afford their first home for a long while. Our federal policies for affordable housing aren't designed to protect families, but rather to protect bureaucrats. We've got a record number of people enrolled in government-operated help programs like food stamps, and my friend, it's not because people want to be in poverty. It's because they are part of the bottom 90% of this country of American workers whose wages have been stagnant for the past 40 years. And as president, as president, I'd launch a curative approach to health care and save money and lives, not just save a bunch of government programs. We face real threats from radical jihadism in the form of savage groups like ISIS and state terrorists like Iran. But we put more pressure on our ally Israel to cease building bedrooms for their families in Judea and Samaria than we do on Iran for building a bomb. I'm running for president because I know there's a difference between making a speech and making government accountable to the people who have to pay for it. You can't spend money you don't have. You can't borrow money you can't afford to pay back. And the federal government ought to live by the rules that you have to live by, and they should function under a balanced budget law just like I had to every year I was a governor. It's not that our tax system is punishing the richest people in America. They can afford accountants and lawyers who will find a way to protect them. It's the people working for wages who can't get ahead if the government penalizes them for trying to do better. As president, I'll work to pass the fair tax, which would no longer penalize people's work. And most importantly, we would finally rid ourselves of the biggest bully in America, the IRS. And that was presidential candidate Mike Huckabee in his announcement address. Uh, the one thing, I guess, in my commentary about Huckabee, um, you know, we went from Obama's hope and change. Now we're going to Huckabee's hope and higher ground. Unfortunately, at least in his announcement address and the clips that we've just heard, we need to hear more about the higher ground. We need to hear more positive. We need to hear, see more inspiration coming out of the former Arkansas governor. Right now, what we're seeing is everything seems to be negative. And right now, of course, you get a lot of the candidates who are... Uh, who sound a lot alike, and it's going to be the uh, upcoming debates that will separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, it is cr true that the fair tax is definitely hopeful, but uh, at the same time, when you're using a speech, when you're using the words not and can't repeatedly throughout, uh, I think we've heard enough of the negativity over the years that I really think that what the people want and what I want and what I hope you want is to see you know, the positive, what, you know, agenda-driven, what he's going to do. Let's inspire people. And we'll uh, see what happens with uh, former Governor Huckabee. Anyhow, we're going to go back to uh, something local that had just happened uh, the other day, and that was a meeting that was going on regarding uh, taking out some lanes in the city of St. Paul and putting in a bike path. Uh, 
traffic downtown St. Paul is already pretty bad. And now if you're going to reduce traffic even further, what is this coming coming to? Uh, what is St. Paul, what, what are they thinking? But anyhow, there was a meeting on Thursday night to explain a little bit more about the plans for these proposed bike paths in the city of St. Paul, and North Star Oasis was there. Here's a clip. What has happened up until now, uh, you may know the city did adopt their bicycle plan, and in it, downtown was identified for further study. So that is the study that we are doing right now. Uh, we kicked it off with a discovery workshop and something we really wanted to learn is what the community's priorities are in terms of selecting the streets uh, for the major routes of the downtown bike system. And some of those major priorities that uh, came to the top were connectivity, both connecting from the neighborhoods into downtown as well as connections within downtown. Also, um, comfort wanting facilities that are well separated from traffic and also facilities you know, that are separated, uh, separate the folks walking from those uh, that are biking. Count how many cars right. are tripped. Uh, they also use video to look at, to, to double check that the counts were right. And we also took counts at critical intersections to see how many people are turning right and left. That helps us figure out if we could maybe get rid of a, a left turn lane or a right turn lane. So it's a very detailed analysis, and they put the numbers in a in the computer and uh, run a model. So they recreate Jackson Street in the computer, put the traffic numbers in there, and run a model to see if the operations work or not. And and there's no chance that this lane, might, this bike lane, might go down the middle. It's got to no, be one or the other side. Right, one side or the other. And yeah. why is that? Uh, one of the goals is to have a real comfortable and not a stressful facility. So if you're in the middle. Right. Um, of it, then you have cars possibly going by you um, on both, both sides. sides right. It also makes it very difficult for the cyclist to turn left and right. So by being on one side, um, at least one way is easier. Right, right. So then instead of having traffic on both sides, you'll have a, a nice buffer to the travel lane or parking lane. Uh, then the two-way bikeway another buffer, and then the sidewalk. So you're also separating pedestrians from cyclists, because you know cyclists move a little bit faster than right. pedestrians, sure. so you want to have a buffer there too. Right. Okay. Yeah, and the reviews are, are undetermined um, at this point, so it could be you know, some type of buffer, it could be green, it could be pavers, it could be whatever. And then the, the two-way bike lane here, and then another buffer to pedestrians. And then of course, Is this picture available electronically somewhere? Uh, not yet, but it will likely when we um, put together the survey, it would be available online that way. Yeah, my problem with the modeling is that you look at all I'm from outside the city, so mm -hmm. when I come in, it's always a hassle to me, and then it's a place where I can get at a store or a, a restaurant or something like that. Is there any modeling about how it is going to be like people coming into the city for a night or something like that? Yeah, uh, for Jackson Street, we did the detailed traffic modeling because we're going all the way to final design. Uh, for the other routes, we went out and counted um, the average daily traffic, so that's how we got our new numbers in the counts um, for how many cars are typically on Wabasha versus St. Peter. So that's, that's a count of the number of cars, but doesn't mm -hmm. really say how people are using the facilities. Uh, well, with Wabasha, since there is more traffic, it is the through movements, you know, to get up to the interstate and also over the river. St. Peter's a little bit quieter because it doesn't go over the river and it doesn't connect to the interstate. Um, so St. Peter, you can drive, is serving much more um, local trips, um, maybe less than those regional trips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, you know, some, some nice destinations and restaurants along there too, close to Rice Park, Landmark Center. Yeah, if you can get to them, you should. Well, now, I'm not going to argue against the need for uh, dedicated areas for cyclists, having been one myself. What I am going to argue against is the fact that St. Paul is not a parking-friendly city as it is, and it is already extremely cumbersome for traffic. I try to avoid going through the downtown area as much as possible uh, while I'm driving, simply because... I can't stand the congestion. So now, does it make sense to you to take an already congested area, reduce a turn lane or two, take out some curbing, and then add a dedicated bike path, and add more of the cars back onto the streets, and 
limit parking options even further. I think this is a bad idea. Now, how, you know, can cyclists and motorists actually get along in the downtown area? Yes. Not if you're going to take Jackson Street and and turn that into a bike lane. That's not going to fly. Now we've got uh, Kellogg Boulevard and, and the park along there. Why not put it there and at least get cyclists into downtown? But let's not take out some of the most congested streets in the city of St. Paul and make them even narrower. I think that's a really stupid idea that they're doing. There should be another alternative. But that's our St. Paul City government for you. Uh, stay tuned. Keep watching because this is going to be on the radar, not just now, but it's going to be in the short, medium, and long terms. And I think it's something that we should really take a much closer look at, especially now that we have the Green Line train coming from Minneapolis that's already narrowed the uh, traffic lanes in uh, downtown even further. So now we're going to take out more parking spaces in order to accommodate cyclists. What's going to happen in winter time? In winter, are we going to have turn this into a dedicated cross-country ski route? I think it's just a bad idea. But now let's go to uh, another thing that happened this week, and that was uh, another Amtrak train um, derailment. But this one, you have got to see. Major accident here at Route 53 and River Road. You can see the immense amount of damage done when the Amtrak train got involved in the accident with this semi truck. Look on the one side, you see the trailer of the semi truck that is overturned and the contents out on the grass on the embankment off of the road here. Then you look to the left of the train and you can actually see the cab that is on a different side of the train. So the cab getting separated from the trailer. Uh, Matt, if you pan out a little bit more, you can see that this train was very crowded. A lot of people on board. They are all standing out here. They're awaiting ambulances. Uh, this has been a 211 box. That means at least 10 ambulances are called out to the scene here. We do not have any word of any injuries, and we'll keep you posted on any developments. We're live here, Route 53 and River Road, Southwest Suburban Wilmington. Uh, Mike Lorber and Sky 5. Wilmington, Illinois. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that is the contents of that trailer were packets of bacon. Now, when you consider the fact that on Sunday we had a Burlington Northern Santa Fe oil train that had hit a uh, truck in St. Paul Park, Minnesota, just south of St. Paul, uh, right out around our um, viewing area, and the oil train hit a truck full of flour. We've got bacon, we got flour, and then when you consider the bird flu that's going around and how it's got an impact on eggs, enjoy your bacon and eggs now while it's still cheap enough. Because uh, this is what's happening. Our railroad and uh, our railroad now is impacting our commodities. And so when you wake up tomorrow morning, fix yourself a good plate of bacon and eggs. Might add a couple of pancakes before all of the prices of those ingredients rise. And we are now going to ask you one other question here, and that is, what is going on in your neighborhood when it comes to energy policy? Uh, there's been a movement, it's called the Clean Energy Movement, that's going on regarding community solar. Is this something that we need? Is this something that we want? Is it cost effective? We'll find out, but we're going to just show you a short introduction video to that right now. Renewable solar power means a cleaner, healthier environment for everyone. But while solar power is now more affordable than ever, it still amounts to less than 1% of the total energy produced in the U.S. Why is that? Well, for the vast majority of us, our homes and businesses are not ideally suited for solar panels. Many of us live in apartments and condos or rent the facilities for our businesses. Some of us may not like the look of panels on our roofs or want the hassle of installing and maintaining them. Oftentimes, we simply cannot afford an entire rooftop solar array. There has to be a better way. Well, there is. Because at Clean Energy Collective, it's our mission to make clean, renewable energy available to everyone. 
And we've found a way by making it more affordable, flexible, and financially smart, even for those who happen to have the ideal roof. How? By bringing community solar to local residents and businesses, people like you, who want a better way to produce their own clean, renewable energy. What is community solar? Imagine thousands of solar panels located in the ideal spot to capture the sun's energy. Instead of producing power for a single house, they produce power for entire neighborhoods. Imagine being able to buy one or as many panels as you need to completely offset your energy needs. It would be like having your very own clean energy power plant. Imagine being able to monitor and share how much clean energy your panels generate by using your remote meter app. How cool would that be? And as long as you keep receiving a bill from the same utility, you can move wherever and whenever you like. The clean energy benefits will follow you. Now, here's the great part. Imagine your local utility has already agreed to purchase the power your panels generate and that it shows up as a credit on your utility bill. Well, you can stop imagining because Clean Energy Collective has already made this vision of community solar a reality. It's a major leap forward because our community solar projects are efficient, utility-grade sources of energy that are built and maintained to last up to 50 years or more, twice as long as conventional rooftop solar. And since you own the solar panels, you're not stuck with lease payments that continue to go up year after year. Instead, with ownership, you get more savings for longer. Today, we are helping to make community solar available to thousands of people and businesses across the country. It's the affordable, flexible, and financially smart way to start generating your own clean, renewable energy. Find out how you can participate for as little as $1 per day at cleanenergycollective.com. It's easy to get started. The environment and your wallet will thank you. And with that, we are going to have a guest today, and I'm going to introduce uh, Jim Carson from Risquant Energy. And uh, Jim, welcome to North Star Oasis. Good to see you again, Jeff. So that your impression of that video? Great marketing. Very good. They're going to get uh, hook a lot of people into investing, investing into this uh, clean energy collective uh, concept. Okay. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on if you like money. If you uh, want to make a good investment, I'd say you should take a much harder look at it than uh, than this video would suggest. It's it's not as um, it's not as attractive as it um, it was a repair. It, it it only works to the extent that there are, are subsidies subsidies and mandates that support it. So can you just give us a rundown locally as to what the whole community solar initiative is? Does that mean that if I just put a solar panel up in my backyard that I can tap into this, or is there a dedicated space for all of this? Well, if you're in your, if you have a, a home that you want to put your solar panel on and so on, that's you can do that, and, and the, it basically is a behind the meter application, and uh, you're allowed to do that. The the utility is supposed to work with you on that sort of thing. Community solar though is where you take a larger installation, uh, let's say in, on land that's otherwise not being put to good use, useless otherwise, and uh, they, they build a, a large facility up to one megawatt. Uh, that's 1,000, um, well, one million watts or, or uh, 1,000 kilowatts, depending on how you want to measure that. So, so how, how big would that be as far as heating and lighting, the energy needs of a residential neighborhood? I mean, uh, one home, my home is, uses a little more energy than average, and we use about one kilowatt per month. One kilo, one thousand kilowatt hours per month. So, a, a megawatt is enough to to do about one thousand, maybe fifteen hundred homes for a month. Okay. Now so, so then, geographically, it'd be kind of like half of White Bear Lake, south of Cedar. Yeah. About that. Give or take. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now the. There's a one megawatt limit on, on the uh, upper limit, and that's one of the areas that Excel Energy is having a lot of uh, trouble with because, because the developers want to take one megawatt and stack them next to each other so that they're essentially a much larger facility 
but that they're taking advantage one megawatt at a time. And they're saying that that is not the way that the program is supposed to work. Basically, you can think of the of electricity distribution as kind of sort of like an onion. At your the core level is your home, and you take it's called uh, there's the socket. And if you are investing in your um, in um, uh, solar panel, you have what's called socket parity, and you compare what the the, the cost of the solar against how much it, you would pay otherwise for, for power from the grid. Then there's the, the grid, which is the outer limit, uh, which we know about, which is, which is uh, where we have um, extensive uh, markets and so on, where we have uh, market pricing and so on. And the, the cost of energy at that wholesale level is, may, is 60 to 75% less than the, the price that you pay. Uh, you're paying for a lot of services between the wholesale price and the retail price. Then in the middle, there's something which the community solar uh, folks are, are taking advantage of, and that's the, 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 this level of distribution. When you have a grid, the, you have a step down from the, from the, the transmission into the distribution system. Okay. Distribution only distributes power. It doesn't, there's generation is never done inside of a distribution network. Well, what's, what uh, this uh, um, solar collective group is doing, and it's now being allowed to be doing, is to generate inside the distribution network um, to offset it. But there's, because of the way that this is put together, there's limits as to how much can be handled, and they've determined for, through engineering studies that a megawatt is the limit. Uh, so that's the that's 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 why Excel Energy is so adamant about enforcing that one megawatt limit is because okay. the, the system's not set up for it. So now, can you tell me about the costs that go into creation of a uh, community solar farm? Basically, it's a solar installation, like any other solar installation that you'd find out there. Um, the cost right now is about three dollars and forty cents a watt. Um, that does that sounds like what does that mean? That's a lot of money. Uh, when you're talking about a megawatt, that's 3.4 million per um, per megawatt. The cost of say a, um, a cheap natural gas fired power plant is about 250,000. I mean, it depends wow. on a lot of factors. So it's 10 times as much money. Now, of course, the the, the uh, gas plant burns um, fuel, and mm -hmm. so that cost has to be taken into account when you when you look at the um, the the cost over the over the life cycle, but the the the, the cost of solar is extraordinarily high. Um, when I've you know and they're they're talking about falling costs and they have fallen a lot, um, but there's three pieces to the cost of, of solar. There's the cost of the panels which are falling dramatically. Then there's the cost of the electronics which have been falling some. That's uh, yeah. mostly inverters and, and cabling and things like that. And then the third thing is the labor that it takes and the, the construction costs to build it. Those have not been falling. So uh, uh, even if the panels fall to zero, which they won't, but if they fall to yeah. zero, solar is still extremely expensive uh, to, to do, again, without the subsidies and without the mandates. Um, when you generate a megawatt hour of, um, of wind or, or solar, you generate what's called a REC, a renewable energy credit. And then that has, that REC is sold and has value. And solar RECs are actually differentiated from wind RECs or, um, or there's even hydro RECs out there, I suppose. Um, hey, let's go back to that video. Sure. When, uh, I'm not going to play it, but, you know, it mentioned about, imagine all of this and, you know, this is so great and so much savings, but if this thing is 10 times more than a conventional energy facility, then how can you have such great savings? Well, you can't without subsidies and, and mandates and renewables and energy credits and so on. Uh, it just isn't possible. Um, you'd, have to, you'd have to drop the cost by, I did, did a, a quick analysis, and you'd have to drop the cost of the... Um, and, and you, do you give us that chart? Yeah, if you want to throw that up. Hey, can we get that chart up here? here? Okay, what we have here is the, the based on current conditions in the marketplace, so it's $3.40 a watt. This is a, a one megawatt um, uh, installation, kind of is with the equivalent of it. Uh, this runs through the, the the basic, most basic numbers. So you have a 3.4 million in, in um, capital investment. Number of hours a year is 8760. That's just 365 by 24. Capacity factor for a solar installation is about 25 percent. That means that because it's in shadow, because of of uh, clouds and so on, you only get about if you install a megawatt of um, solar, you're only going to get uh, a, a, a quarter of that over the, of in value, let's say compared to say a nuclear plant or a coal plant over the course of a year. 
And so you end up then with the, the 3250 is the value of the energy over the past 12 months. That would be from um, uh, Ju June 1st of 2014 to May 31st of 2015. And so 3250 is the um, uh, is what it's worth uh, in the marketplace. The co there's also then the cost of the um, maintenance and upkeep, which is which the solar people uh, tend to downplay. Okay, uh, so on, on this chart, we're looking at the middle column right. is the solar. That's current case. That's yes. Okay, for solar. Right. Okay. So if you take a look at it without the subsidies and mandates, it's a 66-year payback under current case conditions. Um, that is, doesn't even meet the laugh test, in my view. Now let's let's move over to the other column. Take a look at that. It's cut the cost of the installation by fifty percent. Okay. So what what what's the the numbers on the right represent what? Just a optimistic case of is that solar only for solar? Okay. For a solar installation, equivalent solar installation. But I've adjusted the numbers to sort of see what happens if you, you to, to see what it takes to get you down to eleven years. Uh, so we cut the, the capital cost by 50%. We increased the capacity factor from 25 to 30%, and that, that would be fantastic. 25% uh, is even quite good um, by today's standards. It's probably on the high side, but 30% is fantastic. Uh, the, the, we double the value to $65 a megawatt hour, and we come up, we um, actually, the, the cost per megawatt hour then, because of the increased capacity factor, drops the the O and M uh, per megawatt hour, so you end up then with a net value per year for the uh, one megawatt installation of, of 150,000, 11 year payback. By utility standards, 11 year payback is not quite there. Okay. For a, for a generation generator installation, uh, that would be approximately what they would use for their total assets. Return on assets would be about 11 year equivalent to 11 year payback. So to get it down to that level, you have to cut the cost by half, double the value, and increase the efficiency of the uh, of the unit by 20 uh, by 20 percent. So then that those numbers you just represent is that the best case scenario or oh, is no, that no, the that's way beyond best case? Okay, way beyond best case. Way beyond best case. Yeah, you're not the the costs are not falling anywhere near that fast. There's going to be a bottom. Uh, in you know the 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 uh, they're just are labor costs coming down? Well, maybe a little bit, but not enough to to uh, to appreciably affect this. Uh, to, to get that down to from 340 to 170 is um, th that is completely unrealistic. But so it's still you know it's what you have to be unrealistic in order to make these numbers uh, uh, hunt. So. so then, what would it take outside of subsidies? What would it take to get community solar, or any type of solar, actually within reach? Can't be done. Not without the subsidies and the mandates. See, wow. one of the things that's happening is that Excel Energy is being required to buy a certain amount. Well, one thing that people don't understand, Excel Energy just went through a, a major rate case. They want, they want more money. Um, the, the cost of electricity on, from the wholesale markets from 2008 to today has fallen by 50%. So it's fallen from about, uh, 60, about $65 a megawatt hour down to about $32.50. And so why do they need more money? They should be giving us a, a cut, not an increase. Well, the difference is, is that the investment in new transmission to accommodate wind is a big deal. And then the new mandates that they have for solar and for wind, this renewable uh, energy is extremely expensive. And uh, so that's what's preventing them from, you know, from actually cutting rates, when, which is what they should be doing, rather than uh, increasing rates, which is what they're asking for. So then when it comes to situations like what's happening in, I believe, Oakdale, they're trying to bring in the community solar. Is that a good thing for Oakdale or a bad thing, or is it neutral? Well, it depends on how you do the accounting for it. If you look at it from the standpoint that federal money is free money, then it's a good thing. If you look at federal money as being not free money, then it's a bad thing. Um, it's uh, because the, uh, it's the subsidies and the state mandates that drive this. It's not the value. Uh, there is no way that the value of solar uh, is cost justified today. And there's, you, know, the, you hear uh, commentators in, in the industry, in the solar industry, talk about grid parity. What they really are talking about is socket parity. They're mm. saying that the 12 and a half cents that you're offsetting your, um, your payment by uh, is the proper number to use for the offset. And that's that would be a, not true. I disagree with that uh, very thoroughly. See, especially unless you're talking about something that's in the home or on top of a business's, um, or like in a school where it actually is offsetting. 
you still have to run that power through the transmission system, the transmission and uh, distribution system. And there's a concept in uh, utility uh, law called fair, just, and reasonable rates. Okay. So uh, things have to conform to this fair, just, and reasonable. Now that sounds pretty amorphous, but we now have about 80 to 90 years of case law on what on defining what, what fair, just, and reasonable means. And what it has meant is that the you bear the costs of your of what you use in the system. And so if you are using the transmission system, then you shouldn't be compensated as if you were actually providing that service. So mm -hmm. let's say you're at a community solar um, installation. You you have a piece of that. It's you you are being your rate is being offset dollar for dollar, kilowatt for kilowatt against that um, uh, production, except that that power is still going through the transmission system. The, it's being used in, in the transmission system. It, the, the solar uh, provider should not be being compensated for that service. That's a service that's being provided by the utility. They're actually um, essentially being paid for something that they're not doing. So then I guess my last question for today is what in your mind is probably the best case scenario of what should be done with community solar scrapped, kept? Well, I think the most important thing is that they start being honest. Uh, that the advertisement we just saw, which which is which is a, an advertisement, yes. um, was um, showed no numbers and showed does not fess up to the fact that most of the value that this that this installation generates is from from the tax subsidies and and um, and is from offsets from your your electri electricity bill when you should only be being compensated for the energy value of that um, that should at least be be discussed publicly. Um, the uh, the question comes in though, what we should we do for green energy? And the fact is we've done a lot of wind. It's not working very well. Uh, we're starting to do solar now. It's, it's even more costly, less effective. Um, the, uh, the one area we haven't looked at is hydro. Uh, that used to be the major source of electric mm -hmm. generation back in you know, a century ago. Um, up until probably the 1930s, and we should be returning to that as the um, as uh, if we want if we want green energy, we should be looking at hydro as the um, way to go because it's uh, uh, it's quite clean and it's quite uh, we have a lot of it that we're not tapping. Most of the hydro potential in the United States um, is behind dams and it's not being used at all. Um, so uh, uh, we should we should start putting generators where we already have dams. And then there's a few places where we could put uh, large scale um, dams, like uh, let's say at the foot of Fort Snelling, where the where the where that little wing dam is. Yep. That's a, what, a 40 megawatt wing dam, if I'm not mistaken. They could put about- Yeah, you're talking about the one over at the old uh, Fort Assembly. The, four, yeah, the, the, Fort, the old Fort Plant Dam. Um, that, that could be, you could put a real dam there and, and generate probably one to 2,000 uh, megawatts of um, of green energy, and it wouldn't affect. Uh, and there's no environmental concerns because there's already a um, waterfall yeah. about two miles upstream from where you'd put such a dam. Um, that's one thing I've tried to advocate. And every time I um, talk to people in the green industry about damming up the Mississippi River at Fort Snelling, I get these glares that you can't imagine, <laughs> especially the folks at Fresh Energy. Uh, well, with that, Jim, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Your website is riskquant.com, R-I-S-Q-U-A-N-T.com. That's for folks who are in the business. If you're not in the business, it's very dull. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming on, Jim. Take care. And uh, uh, what we have right now is one last segment, and that goes back to something that occurred right after last week's show. Last week I discussed the Battle of Bellow Wood from World War I and the cost of war. And, you know, the huge casualties, the huge deaths that occurred in uh, 1917 and how we have such little combat deaths in war today, but we have a lot more wounded. Right after the show, I got a phone call uh, here at the studio from a Gulf War veteran who was uh, wounded who said, just thanks for not forgetting us that uh, a lot of mainstream media will forget that you know what happened in 1990 91 in the Persian Gulf you know that they overlook that I haven't forgotten how can I forget my comrades in arms but that also gave me something else to think about about the the cost of war and I came across a video 
that you can find online at fallen.io. And we're going to play that for you right now. The uh, folks who do this just did an amazing job with um, alliterating just how costly war is. And we'll get that set up here. The average lifespan of an American is 80 years. And an 80-year-old today was 10 when World War II ended. Four when it began. A soldier who saw battle would have to be in his late 80s, at least today. Generals, political leaders, the decision makers of the war, few are still with us. And over the past few decades, we've seen authors and filmmakers rush to capture stories from survivors before this connection of memory is lost. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're going to tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives are cut short by the war, and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. We'll be counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men. The average age was about 23. In most battles, for every 1,000 soldiers killed, there are more than 1,000 who were injured. The word casualty can be confusing because in military speak, it often includes both deaths and injuries and anything else that takes a soldier out of service. Here, we're just counting the deaths, and we'll begin with American soldiers. Over 400,000 died. Most of the deaths occurred in the European theater, fighting the Nazis. And about a quarter were in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese. When you put them on the timeline, you see that casualties were the heaviest at the end of the war. The war began on September 1st, 1939. But the U.S. wasn't willing to join the fight until Pearl Harbor, two years in. The deaths increased drastically on D-Day, when the Allies invaded Normandy. One of the most tragic moments of the war was on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where 2,500 Americans fell. So about the same number of U.S. soldiers died on this single beach landing as the entire 13 years of the recent war in Afghanistan. The bloodiest battle in the Pacific was Okinawa, which lasted 82 days, during which 12,500 Americans died. About 5,000 of these deaths were at sea from kamikaze attacks. Now let's look at some other countries, starting with Europe. Germany started World War II when it invaded Poland. Poland ultimately lost 200,000 soldiers in the war. Most died after the invasion while the country was occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union. Germany, meanwhile, lost just 16,000 in the invasion of Poland. The Nazis went on to invade and conquer other countries, including Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Greece, and Yugoslavia. France surrendered, but after losing 92,000 soldiers in the Battle of France. Over 200,000 ultimately fell, which includes deaths in POW camps, French colonies, and other fighting. Yugoslavia suffered almost half a million military deaths. The initial invasion brought relatively few casualties on both sides. But the deaths mounted under Nazi occupation due to guerrilla fighting, civil conflict, and mass executions. The Nazi invasions were swift, with relatively few German losses. Even the Nazi commanders expressed surprise at their success. And then we have the United Kingdom and the United States, who were not invaded, but took the fight to the Nazis. Britain lost about the same number of soldiers as the US, which includes the British colonies. Germany lost about half a million soldiers fighting the U.S. and Britain in what is known as the Western Front, 
which took place in France and Belgium. But most Nazi soldiers died in the Eastern Front, Germany's unsuccessful invasion of the Soviet Union. The numbers are staggering. The most famous battle of the Eastern Front, and perhaps the turning point of the European War, was Stalingrad. The German Sixth Army successfully took Stalingrad, but then got surrounded by the Soviets and cut off from food and ammunition. Half a million Nazis would ultimately die in Stalingrad. Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, of which 6,000 would ever return. POWs had a low survival rate throughout World War II, and it was particularly grim in the East. When you include these POWs, roughly the same number of Germans died in Stalingrad as all the Western Front fighting against France, the UK, and the US. And though Stalingrad was a victory for the Soviets, they suffered almost twice as many losses as Germany. The Soviet Union would eventually defeat the once unstoppable German army, killing 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. But winning the war came at a cost. seven million is the official tally by the Russian military, a hotly disputed number. Some studies have calculated as many as 14 million dead. To complete the count of European military deaths, we need to add German deaths from other fronts including the North and Africa, as well as deaths from other Axis powers allied with the Nazis, Hungary, Romania, and Italy. When you put these European military deaths on the timeline, it looks like this. You can now interact with the chart to learn more. Pause the narration if you'd like more time. And now we switch to civilian deaths in Europe. Six million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. If you separate this by country, you see that about half, 2.7 million, were Polish. 700,000 were Soviets, followed by Hungary and 17 other countries. Broken down another way, about half of the 6 million were killed in the concentration camps. Over a million died in Auschwitz. Most were killed in the gas chambers. Others died from starvation, exhaustion, disease, and other forms of execution. The second most deadly camp was Treblinka, which was exclusively an extermination camp, set up to look like a train station. Mobile killing groups killed 1.4 million Jews. Like with the gas chambers, men were killed first to reduce the risk of revolt. The Holocaust also includes non-Jewish deaths. Between 130,000 to 500,000 Roma, then called gypsies, were killed. The numbers are disputed. About a quarter million people with disabilities were killed. Homosexuals, Catholics, and other groups were also exterminated, but their numbers were relatively small. Some historians say that other civilian deaths should go under the label of Holocaust. About two million non-Jewish Poles were killed under German occupation, some of which were sent to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. When you combine civilian and military deaths, 
over 16% of the total Polish population died in World War II, which is the highest percentage of any country. But not the highest in total death count. The Soviet Union again tops that list, losing at least as many civilians as it did soldiers, somewhere between 10 and 20 million. A particularly dark moment for the Soviet Union was the siege of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. German forces surrounded Leningrad before civilians could be evacuated. Supplies, including food, were cut off for two and a half years. One and a half million people died as a result, mostly from starvation, mostly civilians. Stalin's cruelty towards his own people is partly responsible for these numbers. He often didn't allow civilians to evacuate from cities, thinking it would cause the soldiers protecting them to fight harder. About a million Soviets died in Stalin's own labor camps, called the Gulag. Just about every country suffered civilian losses, especially countries who were invaded. While many died as a result of so-called collateral damage, the biggest numbers occurred when it was no accident. Civilians were exterminated, purposely fired upon or bombed, used as human shields, or intentionally deprived of food. The intentional killing of civilians was done by most warring parties, including the United Kingdom and the United States. The United Kingdom was spared of a land invasion, but still lost 60,000 civilians, largely from German air raids or blitzes, often directed at civilian population centers. The UK did the same to German cities at a much greater magnitude, causing about 10 times the number of deaths. But most German civilian deaths came from the ground at the late stage of the war. When the Nazi regime collapsed, civilians living in occupied regions had to desperately flee from the advancing Soviet army. Rapes were widespread, and death estimates ranged from 600,000 to 3 million. Let's step back and see where we are with the totals. We just counted about 20 million civilian deaths in Europe. If you add this to the European military deaths we already covered, it brings us to over 40 million. Then we have the Asian theater. Here we see the vast majority of military deaths in Asia came from China and Japan. On the civilian side, about 6 million deaths from China, Indonesia, Korea, Indochina, and the Philippines can be attributed to Japanese war crimes, which are sometimes compared to the Nazi atrocities due to the sheer scale of the cruelty. China had the second highest death count after the Soviet Union. And like the Soviets, the Chinese government demonstrated a stunning willingness to sacrifice its own people. Chinese nationalists opened the dike at the Yellow River, hoping the flood would halt the Japanese advance. Half a million Chinese civilians or more were killed, which is two or three times the number who died in all countries in the 2004 Asian tsunamis. But the invasion of China only cost Japan 200,000 soldiers. Most were killed fighting the U.S. and allies in the Pacific War. A significant portion of Japanese civilian deaths were caused by American firebombing and the two nuclear attacks. Contrary to official U.S. statements, these airstrikes were directed at civilian populations, not military targets. When you add all the deaths outside of Europe, it brings us to a grand total of 70 million for the war give or take depending on who's counting and what civilian deaths get included. More people died in World War II than in any other war in history. For comparison, here are 20 or so of the very worst wars and atrocities we have on record. Some of these are more of atrocities than wars, but we've seen how that distinction can get blurry. Some of these spanned across centuries. World War II had the highest body count, and it all happened in just six years. The world's population has grown significantly since the earliest atrocities on this list. If you want to compare them in terms of what percentage of the world died, we can adjust the chart to look like this. This rough approximation tells us there may have been more devastating wars before World War II, proportionally speaking. When we turn to post-war conflicts, it's hard to say anything that isn't controversial. But the data shows something quite extraordinary has been happening. 
1989, John Gaddis coined the phrase, the long peace, to identify the absence of conflict between the nuclear powers during the Cold War. 25 years later, the Cold War is over, and the term is still being used, although its meaning may have shifted. European countries have not fought each other, except for this 10-day war in 1956, when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary. When we look at European wars before World War II, it looks like this. They tend to be more frequent as you go back, though smaller in scale. And the largest 44 economies of the world have not battled each other since World War II. Rich countries have fought poorer countries, like the US versus Iraq. But rich countries have not fought other rich countries. Such a period of peace between the so-called great powers hasn't been seen since the Roman Empire. To many, peace is too strong of a word. Wars have occurred since World War II, and they can be grouped into these four categories. We don't see colonial wars anymore. We've already noted that interstate wars between rich countries have not occurred at all. And here we see wars involving smaller economies have tapered off. That leaves civil wars of two types, with and without foreign intervention. And this is what these battle deaths look like alongside of World War II. More people died fighting in World War II than in all the wars since. And again, we can't forget about world population, which has almost tripled since World War II. If we scale these numbers to show deaths in proportion to world population, showing the likelihood that a person on Earth dies in battle, the downward trend becomes even more pronounced. Now, this isn't to infer anything about why this trend is occurring. That's a discussion for another day. You can now interact with this chart to explore what conflicts are behind the totals. Now, bear in mind, we're just looking at battle deaths here, not civilian deaths, but those two are in decline. Peace is a difficult thing to measure. It's a bit like counting the people who didn't die in wars that never happened. We give such importance to the word peace, but we don't tend to notice it when it occurs or report on it. Sometimes it takes reminding ourselves of how terrible war once was to see the peace that has been growing around us. Of course, this trend may not continue. And it's not clear how looking at these charts can help us make the right decisions to ensure that it does. But the longer the long peace grows, the more significant it becomes. So if watching the news doesn't make us feel hopeful about where things are heading, watching the numbers might. was put together by Neil Halloran, uh, Fallen.io, if you want to check it out and really spend some time going through the numbers. And I was also reminded uh, that I did not give our Christmas countdown. And since we're talking about the numbers, we do have 194 shopping days left until Christmas. And so with that, uh, please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube uh, with our handle at North Star Oasis. And then I also was uh, reminded that we do have 83 weeks and five days left until the next presidential inauguration, which is why we try to give you the presidential segment at the beginning of the show. Thanks today to Jim Carson from Risquant Energy for joining us with that enlightened discussion on community solar. And we will see you next week.